Cool.fm is the perfect station for music lovers who enjoy a mix of adult pop, modern country, and classic hits. Our unique blend of different genres creates an awesome listening experience that you won't find anywhere else. With Cool.fm, you don't have to constantly change stations to hear the music you love. Just download the Live 365 app and start listening to our curated selection of modern adult and country hits, as well as the classics you know and love. So tune in to Cool.fm and start enjoying the best of all your favorite music in one place. Hi, I'm Dylan Jacobson, creator and writer of the comic book Champions. You can check it out at championscomic.com or you can go to any of my websites, including dylanjjacobson.com. And you're watching and listening to Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. Of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We're joined today by a very talented and creative person. He is the writer and artist and overall creator of an amazing series called Champions. We are joined by the ever-talented Dylan Jacobson. So how are you doing today? I'm doing pretty well. We've got snow coming down here today, and I'm supposed to have a fundraising event. So I'm hoping, hoping we make it to that. But other than that, I think it's a pretty good day. For those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative person, tell us who you are and what you're bringing to Two Geeks Talking. So I'm Dylan Jacobson. I'm an illustrator and comic book artist. I work in the Midwest. I live in Iowa, but I work for the South Dakota, Nebraska, and Iowa Arts Councils through various organizations. I do teaching residencies where I teach kids to make their own comics. And on top of all that, I do a bunch of my own illustration, including a comic series called Champions, which we're here to talk about today because that's wrapping up. But I also do a lot of things like figure art and commissions, and I, I stream on Twitch and stuff like that. So yeah, there's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. In teaching the younger generation, what have you learned as a creative person? That's a good question. Well, I frequently work with like third grade through middle school. Kids today, whether you think this is real or not, really want to know if what you're doing is a viable career. And there's a lot more room for talking about like, is there any money in this? Like, can I do this as a job? And I think that that's something that older generations, like our generation and older, can I have trouble talking about like what we make and how, how that part works, but kids are really, really interested. So I think if you can be open and accessible about that, that they actually care. And I think that has a lot to do with stuff like content creation, because they see their favorite content creators on YouTube and TikTok, and they want to know what that's about. And comics is a kind of content. So that's a, a big conversation I end up having other than the, the usual part of like, did you draw Spider-Man? And I'm like, well, not professionally, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, I think that's a big thing I learned from them. But I recently worked with a school in South Dakota, which is on a Hutterite colony, and they are kind of insular, and it's like a commune, and a lot of those kids haven't left or read anything other than, like, uh, Garfield. I got to learn a lot about the barriers in language that I have that only exist in certain scenarios, but it helps to enlighten me to, like, what might kids in other classrooms might, like, not catch on to, because there's verbiage I use that many people get that those kids didn't get, and we had to, we had to, like, take a moment and break things down. What's one verbiage that you use that maybe they weren't aware well, of? Well, so this is specifically comics related. I, every day in that classroom, I drew a comic on the board with their guidance. And we had a cheetah eating a deer. And I was like, oh, I'm going to take this another direction. It's going to be at a restaurant. And he was holding a menu. And they, they had never heard of a menu before because they, they live a lot more insularly than most people would expect to live and so they've never been to restaurants they've never had to ask for a particular kind of food and i think it's good to to try to assess like what do people know uh and what do they not know when you're working with them and so even if it's something as simple as that like what you're representing the big thing i try to tell people is it doesn't matter whether your art is like perfect or not the goal in storytelling is clarity so if, as long as people know what you're trying to say then you achieved it in my opinion i think that's also a good thing to impart on younger kids because they're always like oh mine doesn't look perfect and i'm like we got eight what do you expect? You're, you're, but, you're not, you know, Jim Lee or Kirby right? or any of those wonderful people, you know. <laughs> right. So give yourself a break, you know. Yeah. Yes. Well, let's talk about your amazing series with Champions here itself. You know, I got to read it. It's an amazing series from, from what I saw. And it's really an incredible journey that you've had over 
the books that you've created. But for those that don't know anything about Champions, what is the sure. elevator pitch and summary of this amazing series? That's a great question because it's taken me a few years to put this together. I thought at first I would just be able to shoot through all six issues and be done. Uh, so the initial pitch was this is a story of four different characters of different walks of life having to come together to do the right thing. As I've changed as a person, I'm, I have different perspectives and opinions on the comic myself. Doing the entire thing independently, I started in 2016 and I wanted to do the whole story, like one big story, like 150 pages. And I was encouraged by like fellow artists around me, even people working in comics, like do one issue. And if you get one issue done and then it all falls apart, you got one done. Instead of having like a half finished graphic novel in a corner somewhere. And I think that's both good and bad advice. I think if you feel like you have the steam to just do it, then, then maybe just do it. Who knows? I'm in, I'm in the situation I'm in. <laughs> uh, I've gotten about one out every year on top of doing conventions and working with kids and stuff. And then the pandemic happened and I put the book on the back burner. So now I, I feel like the story is actually about more about differences, resolving differences as opposed to like doing the right thing. You know, I, I teach a lot about storytelling when I work with kids. And one of the things I like to tell them is when you're thinking about your theme, like what your story is about, it's good to write down what you want it to be. And then when you're done, you need other people to read it, tell you what they think the theme is. And if it's not what you wrote down, then you got two answers. You can fix everything to make it fit the theme or change what theme you wrote down. I think that I'm somewhere towards the second one where I'm like, I'll just change the, the pitch. It is a superhero story, but they're all plain clothes. So I think now I would say it's a story about four different people overcoming differences which I think is maybe more impactful, but I'm not sure. It sounds like a, you've, you've modified it to what it needs to be. And, you know, a great story, great writing overall here. Love, love the art style as well, too. We'll talk about who your colorist is as well in a little bit here. But what is the most misunderstood aspect about the superhero genre that people who don't follow it misunderstand? That's a good, uh, a really great question. I think What's really misunderstood is the difference between iconic and dynamic characters. And now I'm only working in six issues, so it's hard to be truly dynamic because uh, the concept of iconic is like you're never changing your stalwart concept. And I think that a lot of people have that thing in mind when it comes to superheroes. But if you're like, if you avidly follow things like Marvel, they're way more into the dynamic concept of like these people can change, opinions change, goals and outlooks change. And so I think there is going into superheroes, especially looking at like mythology, like Hercules and stuff, this concept that these are all like rigid, unchanging characters and you've got to be in it for the powers and how they behave in the world because they're always going to be the same. And I think that that's something that things like Marvel are starting to strip away, but I do think that's a, a general consensus that like, well, Superman is always the Boy Scout, you know? I think there's more in the genre than people give it credit. I, I like dialogue, you know, I grew up with like Kevin Smith and stuff. Oh, yeah. So this isn't going to be just people getting punched in the face. <laughs> so, yeah. You actually have character arcs and character emotions and things that aren't really portrayed in say like a two hour movie or something like that as much as a series right. or a comic book can a lot for sure. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So then how have you evolved when you first started this series as a writer? to now wrapping up the series itself well especially having the break so the, the reason i paused for the pandemic was i take my books to shows and when there's no shows you know, I'm not super big reason to print books right now in that time i've developed things like i have a weekly newsletter i do and i've written i've written some one-off stuff like i've been working on spec scripts for tv shows that i like so i'm like oh, can i write in that world and find somebody to email it to you sort of thing i've noticed that i've developed a lot as a writer in a direction where i feel like oh this the, the writing is better but i had a lot of the scripts ready for all six issues of champions a while ago, basically around the time I was finished illustrating issue four, the series was written. I'm going back in now and adjusting what I can as I finish illustrating pages. Like I don't want the ending to be wildly different from what the original intention was, but I want the dialogue to be a little bit better. I want to use my words more deliberately. I think it's good that I have that opportunity, but I think it's also challenging because I want to stay true to the ideas I had in the past. And it's like, how do you honor a version of yourself that you may have grown out of or grown away from perhaps? It's amazing to see progress is the main thing, because when you look at what you created, not many people can say, one, that they've created a comic series, and two, not many people can say that they finished a comic series for that matter right. here. <laughs> you know, the small victories of actually being a creative person is completing what you've set out to do. And I think you've done that, and I can't wait to see what else you have in store as well. Uh, I appreciate that. It is a tremendous challenge. And I think one of the things that helped keep me going is 
not frequently, but enough people will be like, hey, like, it's really, really awesome to be able to see you follow through on that. Uh, I had someone the other day comment on my Facebook that like there have been people in my hometown. I don't, I don't live where the book takes place anymore, but people there who have mentioned that like my work has had an impact on them wanting to do stuff. And that's super cool. So those things do help keep the wheels going. Looking at yourself as a creative person, writer and artist combined here, what are three things that you've accomplished that you're proud of in the past? And what are three things sure. you're looking forward to accomplish in the future things i'm proud of from the past well i completed a series of figure art that i'm pretty proud of it's been mildly controversial which i think is good i got a comic book out i thought it was going to take me until my mid-30s i started when i was 27 and i'm 35 so i've got i've got more than one comic book out so i think that's a big thing i've completed a coloring book which was really cool and three things that i'm looking forward to i need some brevity this the series uh, champions isn't like depressing necessarily but it's heavier the content is a little more you know existential so i'm looking forward to working on something that's contemplating working on things that have some absurdism in them i'm trying to think what are the big things on the horizon i've got a new figure out series want to start in april so i'm looking forward to that and then i've also been dabbling in chalk art i've done one professional chalk piece and i, I want to do more so i've been applying for work related to that so i'm excited to see where that goes so i think those are good answers <laughs> branching out creatively you're trying to keep yourself yeah. fresh and from a creative perspective and it's always great to push boundaries and push yourself to different levels there it's great to see yeah, it can be daunting like i've done you know i've done people's D, D characters and stuff like that but when you apply for a chalk show and all you have is like this comic book and some like drawings of fantasy characters and you still get in like that's Pretty cool. I appreciate where things develop and change, but sometimes it's hard to say like, what's tomorrow look like? Because I, I don't know. I can wake up feeling wildly different tomorrow. Let's yeah. focus on the here and now. Then, yeah, I, I try to. It's you know, it's not perfect, but it is good to try to focus on the now, especially when you've got about twenty pages left of the whole series. We'll have the, this hundred and fifty-ish page book. I'm doing the the writing, the penciling, and the inking for the series. You know, when each page is done on my drafting table, it's like that page is done. Sure, I'm going to do a little digital editing and send it off to the colorist, but for me, that's done. There's something pretty rewarding about that, but you do have to be able to stay in the now. Otherwise, it can be like 20 pages. Holy crap. So who's your colorist then now that you've segued it perfectly? So I've worked with two colorists. The first book was a colorist named Galatia Pocos. Uh, they live in Sioux Falls. Both of my colorists live in Sioux Falls where the book takes place. They were focusing pretty heavily on uh, transitioning into being a developer and moving away from doing art professionally. So... I acknowledge that and found someone else. Now I'm working with Travis Bentley. Uh, he does a lot of fantasy robot art and watercolor. And so his his challenge is to basically take the palette that Galatia created and interpret it into the, the color scheme for champions. And I think he's done a great job of adapting it. Uh, I mean, if you look closely, you can tell it's two different artists, but I don't think it's bad by any means. And one of the questions I get a lot now, especially now that I've done some professional coloring is like, how come I didn't color it? Well, one of my original goals was if I draw it and someone else colors it, then we have two times the audience for the work. And so I think, especially when you're doing something that's very grassroots and uh, I'm independently publishing this, there's a big benefit to having, spreading out the reach yeah. by having more people work on it. And you get a couple of different eyes on it as well too, creatively speaking, especially when it comes to say maybe page load or panel design, like their input might yeah. benefit or assist you in laying things out in the future. Right. I can entirely agree with that. And I'm working with four primary characters in the book. We've got a guy named Danny who has a gun and he wears a clown nose. He could see clowns and people can't that eat people. It's a, it's a, the darkest part of the story. And he wants to destroy them. And then we have another guy named Michael who gets split into two parts of himself. That it's not necessarily good and evil. It's just uh, the, the polarizing things inside us all. Um, and then we have a girl named Alex who can manipulate people's emotions. Uh, and I'm not going to get too elaborate on that because we get really deep into that in the final couple books. And then a guy named Muggy who lives forever. And so I wanted to tell four coherent stories that came together. And part of that was working one-on-one -on -one with the colorist to come up with like, what palettes are we using in order to convey like, this is Danny's story. Even if he's not on this page, you know 
this is his part of the story you know so his is all red and orange and black and then uh, michael's all purple just so much purple you, you know it's him because it's just purple everywhere so <laughs> it has probably been a challenge for both colorists but it's a really wonderful thing for the reader uh but then i think will also become a bigger challenge in the last two issues because the stories begin to blend together to the point where the final issue is just one story so how is that palette going to work we'll see we're coloring it right now <laughs> color theory is always impressive as well too especially those that have dived into that area of illustration uh, you see it in, in art you see it in uh, film and tv as well too it's amazing how a simple change of lighting can evoke different emotions or a different color palette of is just incredible to see though and i don't think a lot of people understand the color theory when it comes to not only comic books but art in general yeah, I think that's a, a good point. And I, you know, I've studied art. I went to college for filmmaking and the graphic design. And I think I'm good at color theory, but the, I've worked with people who are so extremely good at it that it makes me feel like I almost know nothing. There is a whole world, you know, you could get into like advertising of like, you can even suggest certain feelings, thoughts, hunger, the, the will to spend money using colors. And it's, you know, those aren't givens, but they're a part of design. I think that that is a, a deeper thing to look into. I find it interesting what an audience does think is deeper than it actually is. Like I've got a scene uh, in the first book where the character Muggy is feeding some pigeons. And my script, when I wrote it, just says there's several pigeons. It's the 19th of 24 pages of the first book. And so at that point, I drew those one page a day every day for 24 days. I didn't give myself any breaks. I don't think I would ever work that way again. But <laughs> I looked at my script and said, that's too many pigeons. So I did four, four pigeons. That's plenty. There are four heroes. There's four bad guys. And I had someone at the debut of the book go, I love that there's four pigeons. And on the next page, we see the first appearance of all the bad guys. And he's like, I'm pretty convinced these pigeons represent the villains. And I was like, sure, exactly. <laughs> it has nothing to do with me not wanting to draw lots of pigeons. I do all of uh, the ink and pencil work traditionally on paper. Uh, and so I have had scenes where it's like the same setting twice and i draw it all twice i'm not in photoshop copying and pasting it. and there are definitely days where i'm like man i should just Copy should have done this digitally but i love having the traditional pages i think they're really great to like bring new events show people at the end of the day they create another product which some people get interested in I, it takes place like i said in sioux falls and i've had people purchase pages because they see a business they love i think that's a really interesting way to connect with the community it goes back to the whole area of you draw what you know you draw what you experience and you bring your life experiences into the storytelling that you have whether it's conscious or, or subconscious for that matter yeah and that was a, a big thing in so when i was studying filmmaking in school in college it was like you gotta write stories about stuff you know yep. and, the, and so when i was thinking about that i was like where would i put these characters i'm like well i know this town the town i had spent the most time in, and it still is i haven't lived there for four years but i've spent more time in sioux falls than anywhere else and i lived downtown while i was writing the series so the whole series is downtown and still like now that i'm a couple hours away i'll pull up like google earth and like zoom in and stuff make sure i've got certain buildings look right and get things in there and it does run it you could say like you know spider-man takes place in new york and then you only ever draw the real new york skyline but everything else is just kind of baloney you just, you just squeeze it in whatever in there you can i'm trying really hard to keep it real like the villains have a base in a building that is no longer there it was at the time that i started uh, but it was like going to be demolished. And I'm like, this is a great building to use. It has since been demolished. So like the universe is a little bit separate, but like in that universe, this vacant building is being used by these sinister forces. You know, people walked by it every day. So I, th I think there's some, some power to that. What was an early experience where you learned that language had power? Ooh, ooh, I was not ready for that one. The language had power. Okay. Um, in college, I was a part of my college radio station. Uh, I actually was the president of the station for two years. I had learned while in that role that we were a, we began as a pirate radio station that was allowed to go legit by becoming campus radio. That was before my time, uh, but we didn't have any like school funding. So everything we did was uh, legalized by the school paying for the licensing for a couple of record labels, ASCAP and BMI specifically, 
Other than that, we didn't have money to get the music. There was a gray area of like, well, if you had the music and then the school got a hold of it, they are paying for the licensing. You're not going to get in trouble. So we would encourage people to bring in their own music. We'll let you go legit on your piracy if you bring in our music. I and one other DJ went to our convocation. We were supposed to represent the radio as a club and just be like, hey, we'd love new members. Goodbye. And we took like, instead of doing one minute, we took like 10 minutes and made jokes about how we have to pirate music. And then we bounced. We ran out of there because we're like, we don't want anyone of any merit to catch us and the school president cornered us in the hallway and we're like oh my god we are in so much trouble and his only response was i didn't know you didn't have any budget you had no funding we weren't in trouble it got us expedited from meeting to get funding so then after that every semester we had like thousand dollars for like new equipment and remote projects and buying music which you can buy a lot of music for that but it also spins faster when you're a radio station wow. that was a powerful moment to learn that like what you say can matter and that depending on how you say it certain people might be listening <laughs> even on a pirated radio station <laughs> the way that was that our message was delivered has that has rippled into other experiences I've had. I was doing a convention in Sioux Falls called Supercon. And there's some guys who run a podcast called Wednesday Comics. And they're like, hey, we'd love to have you on the show. We're doing a live episode. We'll get you a couple beers if you can come do a debate with a guy. We got this guy named Phil. And I'm like, cool. I don't know who Phil is, but let's do this. They give me the beers. I drink one really quick because I'm like, I should probably be a little loose or whatever. And I get in there with the other one, like half drank in my hand. And they're like, Dylan, meet Phil. This is Phil Hester. He works on several things for Marvel and DC, including you know, like Green Arrow. And I was like, gulp i primed myself for this and then they had us debate indie comics versus industry comics and he was representing indie and i was representing industry and i said a lot of loudly stupid things that i would have regretted had i fully understood who i was going up against but i think that primed us to have a better relationship because afterwards he took me aside and was like we should have lunch and now i have a working relationship with him so i think had i been really closed off and not candid that probably wouldn't have happened so there is something to be said about like just say the thing you need to say even if it sounds crazy like pirating music it's amazing who you can connect within in the industry because comics whether you're indie or from a, a major publisher like the big two etc it's a small circle it really is like it is, it is how many times you're going to go to a convention and run into someone that you saw at another city three weeks oh yeah time. yeah it's incredible how many people you can run into and just one like novel experience with them they won't forget who you are and you know, i'm not trying to tell people to go design novel experiences like don't turn everything you do into improv but it doesn't hurt to have an original experience with somebody Everyone usually asks, what's the wisest piece of advice or what's the most bullshit piece of advice you've ever received? But what is the second wisest piece of advice uh, that you've received that has stuck with you in your career? Okay. Okay. Um, the second wisest piece of advice, I think this applies to all careers. So I think everyone can tune into this. Change your underwear every day. Uh, and the reason I'm going to say that is I, I used to volunteer at an art, a blog, and I interviewed a bunch of artists. One of them said that for like, what advice does you want to give to new artists? He was being jokey about it, but his big, big intent was like, basically take care of yourself, clean up, get dressed, you wear something new today. And, you know, I have had bad days where I'm not the cleanest version of myself, but I do think if you can prioritize yourself a little bit and change your underwear every day, you're going to have a better day. It's easier to make stuff if you're having a better day. <laughs> Second best piece of advice. There you go. I had to fight with that online that blog to keep that in there because they're like that's not like our taste and i was like i think it's really important <laughs> like keep it in there is there a comic that made you feel the way you hope readers of your work will feel after reading it Ooh, yeah yeah i think i can name that pretty quick the sculptor by scott mcleod mm -hmm. uh it, it's i think it's a comic book that anybody who wants to be a creative person should read scott's a very good storyteller he wrote all the making comics graphic novels that teachers employ in classrooms or deploy i should say so it's a great read and the the big question is like what are you willing to give up to have the things you want like what are the stakes you're willing to have because in that story the main character is given the opportunity to be literally the perfect artist you can touch things and mold them even like concrete and metal but he'll only get 200 days to live death gives him this opportunity and so, like, is he willing to sacrifice the anything beyond 200 days to make the perfect things? I think th those are great questions to ask. I think so if my book makes people ask questions about their own choices or how they uh, attempt to approach a problem, then I think I did the right thing. I think that's why it's about, you know, dealing with differences. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? 
Oof. Okay, so I'll try to be quick with it. The person that got me into comics is not somebody that I appreciate any longer, so it's hard to give them credit, but I really looked up to the art style of Doug Tenaple. We have significant differences, and like I said, I don't really look up to his work anymore, but I don't think I would be where I am without him. So even not the greatest people can inspire better things to happen. Sorry, this difficult. Is a, sorry, yeah. this is a quick cut here. Um, I don't know the name specifically so from a professional standpoint you are wrapping up an amazing series with champions here and i can't wait to see what you do next in your professional career and it's being sold in many locations and i hopefully your event today doesn't get canceled so professionally right. you are successful in that regard yeah do you consider yourself personally successful Oof. I have troubles just like everybody else. And on a day-to-day -day basis, I think that answer can vary. But right now, I would say more yes than no, which is the best answer I can give. Because success, it changes. So I think giving ourselves grace is the best way to find success. And right now, I would say yes. Don't ask me a week ago. <laughs> so. or, or next week. I'll, I'll ask you on Twitter. Yeah. How was, how was right. Ask me every day. Just, yeah. just <laughs> set up a bot. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll set up an auto auto uh, post yeah. there for you. <laughs> how you doing today, Dylan? <laughs> <laughs> Shut up. Quit spamming me. <laughs> right. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? Uh, that's a great question. Failure can be incredibly challenging. I think one of the things that I really benefit from is I'm really communicative and close with my spouse. And so I, all the raw feelings I usually spill out to her. It can be difficult to, to fail, like I said, but a lot of times failure can show you a new pathway to things that could be successful. I think it's, it's good to try to keep your eye on like what's working. But I think having outlets helps me a lot dealing with failure. The younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way, whether it's as a comic writer, artist, or creative person in some way, shape, or form, maybe you've inspired them on that path. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? Leave a mark somewhere, put your work somewhere. Don't leave it in a shoebox under your bed. And I think it's easier to leave a mark now with the internet. I think it's easy to get lost in the void of the internet, but put your work into the world because you have no idea who's going to find it and like it. Quick anecdote, one of my very first comic projects was a web comics, no longer available, but I took a long hiatus because I just wasn't feeling like anybody cared. And then somebody messaged me on my website saying, hey, I was reading this web comic while I was in the hospital for several weeks recovering from surgery and I don't like that there's a big cliffhanger. Can you tell me what went wrong? Because I want to read it again. And that was super important. Put your work out there. Somebody's paying attention to it. What was the web comic? It was called Little Alice. It was like a weird character. She was a genetically engineered, like superhero, sort of riffing off of Buffy. And everybody had like animal powers. All the villains were from the same like experiment she was from. But she got bonked in the head at the beginning, kind of like Goku. Now she's not evil. It, it wasn't very good. It was a thing I put into the world. So put your stuff out there. If your life was a comic book or a movie, what mm -hmm. would its title be? And mm -hmm. what would its soundtrack be? Ooh. Soundtracks are really important to me. The giant secret behind Champions is they're all inspired by different music. And I'm not trying to like tell the story of those songs, but I'm trying to use that music to like sort of inspire where things are going. Oh man, a soundtrack for me. So I've really gotten into ska as I've moved into my 30s. I, I went to several ska concerts as a teen or a teen and like early 20s. And then the peppiness yet sort of existential crisisness going on in the music, it really relates to me right now. So I think it would probably be something Scott related. What would the title be? The title of my comic? Oh, gosh, I don't know. That's a good question. Well, I'm just going to use one that I, I used to use as a journal. I think I just call it the good fight. I'm trying really hard to, to do good things, make good things. I fall down a lot, but I've so far I've been able to pick myself back up. Well, Dylan, I do hate to say it, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. Yeah, I appreciate being here. It was awesome. Before I let you go, where can we find you? How can we support you? Of course, where can we find you online and what is coming in the future for you? 
big thing check out my kickstarter uh, if it's still running uh, ch- you can go to championscomic.com it redirects to the kickstarter right now so that'll be all six books in one trade paperback super cool the kickstarter ends april 4th if you want to check out my website for all the things i do with like artist residencies and stuff like that it's dylanjjacobson.com otherwise you can see me on twitter dylan j jacobson uh instagram the dylan jacobson i hate that i can't get the same handle everywhere i try my best and then if you want to see my figure work uh, a little bit some of it's a little bit adult uh, you can go to brimstonestudios.com that's my my new like working studio name and i've got a lot of cool stuff on there well like i said that ends this particular episode of two geeks talking you can of course find this interview and a thousand plus others on our website tgtmedia.com or two geeks talking.com that's the word two, not the number two website's not working quite as well as it should be so i redirect everyone to our youtube channel which is youtube.com forward slash c forward slash tgt media of course the podcast is back after 13 or so years you can find that on two geeks talking.podbean.com but it is available on all of your favorite audio streaming services so Check it out there, support it, like it. This interview is going to be on the show as well, too. So check it out there. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening and watching on Two Geeks Talking.